The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. Let's do the news article first. Uh, My wife was very kind to Xerox right from the newspaper and then do some um, uh, Photoshop editing <laughs> to get a clean copy of this article. And uh, that this might be the best one to scan in. such as it is, but it has those three pictures in there, and it has it laid out just like it really is. Let's talk about it. Give me um, a, a synopsis of it, and give me your thoughts about it, and when you give me your thoughts about it, uh, tell me how you think it relates to this class, and anything else you want to make say about it. That was my uh, learned judgment. Not everybody agreed, what, but yeah. What do, you, what do you think he said? What in particular? What engineering um, is about? Like what? So what let me see if I can find a quote. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How did the, did the, I don't know, you didn't have the pictures, but at least I think I showed them to you at one time. You did. You showed them to it, and now we have Is it the notion that, um, that engineers believe nothing can ever be risk-free? Yeah, like that was a little disturbing also, just the acceptance of. The nature of, lethal, of the lethality of yeah. it all. Well, I think that even when I wrote that article, I don't think that there was an engineering engineer living who thought that engineering was risk-free. No. Now, they were divided as to whether or not they were going to tell it to everybody. Right. And they were happy that a lot of people thought that it, that it should be risk-free, that it wasn't built into the system to be risk-free at that time. Uh, people are wiser about that now. Um, take a few moments before I start commenting. Uh, try to find your quote. Uh, give me some. Give me some uh, more feedback on what you think of this thing. Well, here's one. Yeah. Some engineers now espouse a morality that explicitly rejects the notion that they have as their prime responsibility the maintenance of public safety. Yeah. Okay. Which again, <laughs> I think it's true, but again, it's, it's disturbing, you know. Well, yeah. So he takes that stance, and I mean, you don't take that stance. You present that claim, and then say, and here is what they do take as the kind of. Yeah. Here are three other options. So I, I read this article after I read it the first time. The second time I read it to try to, you know, make concise states, concise statements for the four possible moral codes that you suggest for engineering. So i and I want to make sure I got them right. So the first one is public safety is. always be made with personal judgment and we should balance commercial interests of the client, of the public, and of our company. And if we use common sense, it will come out okay. So that seems to be option number two. Keep going. And then option number three um, seems to be what you call the contractarian code. And so this is to base decisions on um, only the entity with whom you have 
notion of like having a contract with the public for their safety doesn't exist because it's not official, it's not legal. And so that the engineer who would subscribe to that ethics would say, I just have to worry about what the actual contract is. And then the last one you suggest, I think, is this ethic of informed consent that we base our actions, um, well, we take action to inform the public of the risk that we're taking in engineering because we define engineering as experiments with human subjects. Mm. And we have a responsibility to let mm. you know that it's not just applied science, that, there are, that we're using our intuition. So it was interesting the way you talked about intuition with a capital I. Yeah. But, so that seemed to be the fourth one. And I thought maybe that was the one that you would support the most because you presented it last. Okay, let me tell you what got lost in the editorial. <laughs> um, the original title for this paper, well, let me give you the background. Let me give you the background. Um, uh, the uh, editor of this piece, is, and I think that was Joe, his name was Joel Garreau. Uh, my memory on that is 99%. Okay, I think that's who it was. Um, Joel Garreau called me and said that he had called the uh, public relations office at, at, at all of the universities in the area and said that he was starting a new section, a new idea in the Washington Post that he called Outposts. And what he wanted to do was to get some issues uh, that scholars thought were issues and bring them down, and I say down, I don't really mean down in the sense of um, a lower level of intellectuality, but a different kind of language, plain language, a plain language explanation of what the scholars are, are talking about, what they're debating. Okay, everybody else is talking about something, what are the scholars talking about? That was his point for this thing. And so uh, the, per the person who was head of uh, uh, the um, public relations office gave me my name, and we discussed. I said, well, I got three pieces. No, four pieces, I think, I had at the time on my desk uh, that were in various stages of completion that we could discuss, and he settled on this one. The original title was... Cicero is dead, period. Long live technology. And I started the paper off with a quote from Cicero. Y'all know Cicero. He was a great uh, uh, Roman uh, orator and lawyer. Um, Cicero said, the safety of the public shall be the highest law. And I wanted to argue that the safety of the public was not the highest law in engineering, no matter what anybody in 1986 thought it was. Okay. Uh, so I gave him, it took about a month to finish the paper, I think, and I gave him over a document that was 30 pages long. <laughs> and he broke it down to uh, enough to fill this up. But it took up a whole lot of uh, paper, pages, you know, in the post. And um, what motivated me to write that uh, paper was that I was chairing and had been chairing for uh, a couple of years a committee, the, the ethics committee of the organization we talked about before, the AAES, the American Association of Engineering Society. And we wanted to get this ethics code for the whole of the profession. Civil engineers, the mechanical engineer. I'm talking about the professional societies now. This was an organization of the professional societies. Okay. So I had just completed formal training uh, and had gotten my degree, formal training in engineering ethics from RPI, 
had gotten my degree officially in 85. And I'm sitting there with these engineers, and we are debating these various, this, this issue, these is, that particular issue. And what happened in the debate was exactly what happens in a philosophy class. The philosopher will put an issue on the floor and then ask you, well, what, did Plato, what would Plato say about this? What would Aristotle say about this? What would Kant say about it? And going around. And maybe they'll get at the end of the class what you will say about it. But they want you to know what all that, that's, that. In my experience with engineering ethics, when all but two of my professors were philosophers, because we were just starting the field, so nobody had a degree. And so the people who were starting the field did not have a degree. Okay, they were all, almost all philosophers. Uh, 75 to 85 percent of my classes would take that very format, put an issue on the table, and ask what the various philosophers would say if they were sitting here about it. I'm sitting in this uh, meeting, chairing this meeting, with these engineers, all of whom said, that they had never taken a formal course in ethics before. And what they said in there could be categorized just like a philosophy class. Somebody said what Aristotle would say. <laughs> Somebody said what Plato would say. Now, it was, don't get me wrong, they were not uh, entirely astute about what they were saying. The point is that it was just natural for them to come out with these different points of view. Somebody would say there's a principle involved. Somebody would say it's the consequences that matter. None of them has studied Kant. None of them has studied Mill. Okay. So there is, um, so I said, well, this is a gold mine. So I wrote it up. Those points there were the points that came out at that meeting. And each engineer was in a position to speak responsibly, that is, for his, it was all men, uh, organization, and for his, and all of them old, experience. So when I said that most engineers think, or that some engineers think, that was a credible interview with people who said that, and it corresponded with my experience, um, that that's what they think about these things. Okay. So uh, actually, those four points are made um, in that, from that motivation that these engineers had actually just followed the book without knowing that they, <laughs> without having read the book, and without really being, um, uh, re without really doing it in a in a very defensible way, but it's natural that if you if you walk into a class of fifth graders and say is it right to kill, somebody's going to say no because that hurts their feelings, and somebody's going to say no because it's wrong to kill. <laughs> it's just that. So Plato and Aristotle were not coming out of uh, uh, some very some abstraction with their views, that, uh, but it took a lot of work to get it in a defensible form. Okay, so that's what motivated those four points. Right. Uh, and so I was coming out, now what, what I was coming out on those four points wa with was that uh, all of them rested on the premise that the safety of the public comes first, uh, except for one of them. That's the one where uh, the person said you have to weigh these things into a balance. Mm -hmm. And so what I argued either there or in the, definitely in the meeting with him, uh, and I used the word argue not to be confused with the word quarrel. I argued with him, and he never gave an answer, that when... When you say that you have to weigh these things out and get a balance, then my question is, what rule establishes the balance? And his answer was, you just know a balance when you see it. And there is a legitimate kind of ethics called intuitive ethics. <laughs> right. It's not popular anymore but it's a legitimate form of ethics. And that is that people just know the right and the wrong when they feel it. Now, it all goes back to something we're going to uh, discuss a lot more later when we get into the narrative approach, and that's Plato's ethics. 
And Plato was interested not so much in what we're doing, and that is a reasoned approach to an ethical problem. Plato said mostly that there is such a thing as a virtuous person. So he's talking about character. And a virtuous person would just know the right thing to do. So there's your intuition. What did he count as the virtues? Well, there were Greek virtues. <laughs> Heroism, <laughs> you know, and uh, all of that, which means that they won't be the same as what you would, re would require as virtues. But the important thing is that he spoke from the standpoint of an entire culture. He could write down half a dozen virtues, and everybody would say, yes, <laughs> you know, this is what we think is, is, is a good person. This is what I want my sons and daughters to be like. All right, so that's what that was about. Um, what about some of the other stuff that's in there? Um, okay, can I just ask? I'm just looking at a little bit of stuff. Is it, <laughs> is it, that's good. Is it common to think of engineering as an experiment done on? Now, let me tell you that. Well, I mean, this, maybe I was the only one slightly <laughs> by that statement. All right, I'm going to give you a name. I'm going to have to spell it. I'm going to give you two names. Okay. The first name, the first name is Mike Martin. And the second name is Roland Schinzinger. They're mentioned in the article. Is it, his name is in the article? Their names, yeah, right where you say it. Yeah, right where I say it. And they have a book entitled Engineering, Engineering Ethics. Uh, and uh, they wrote their article before, they wrote their book, I think, before 86, 83. Okay. Um, Roland became um, an assistant dean of engineering at the uh, University of California at, starts with an N. Okay. All right. Well, he was an assistant dean at the University of California. No, it starts with an N. Anyway, um, uh, and uh, he invited me out to his house one day for dinner. I was in California, and so I drove down, and he and his wife and I stayed up half the night talking about this, that, and the other. Life. Roland's... Um, One of Roland's parents is German, and he grew up in Japan. His father was a um, diplomat in Japan. And so Roland's views on the world um, can be very unique. And so when he st stood up one day in, in a conference and said, engineering is an experiment with the public as its human subjects, the whole place. <laughs> Exploded. Exploded, I, I mean, in a positive way. I mean, God, just open up doors. How, who would ever, I mean, that was just a different way of thinking about the whole thing. And for a time, uh, many of us thought that that was going to be the basis for a philosophy of engineering. That that's really what made the difference between engineering and science. Uh, it, never it never worked out. 
but it was a very um, interesting way of thinking about the thing. And Why did it not work out? No one. I don't know. No. <laughs> it. Uh, Maybe because it's unsettling for people to think that it's part of this experiment and if we could catch on with mainstream. Right. <laughs> Well, if that was the case, if if uh, uh, then we can hope that maybe 20 years from now, after are you familiar with the term "the dust settles" after all of the politics it tends to be um, no longer uh, emotionally inspiring, mm -hmm. uh, that maybe that idea will come back. Ideas do come back, but it was definitely out of favor at the time. And again, it's not so much that I disagree with. with the, I mean, I I frankly think it's ingenious way of picture what engineers do, so yeah. I'm not saying I disagree with it. But it was kind of disturbing to start to think about it in that sense. Oh, people were very hostile. Uh, they, when I say people, the academicians were not hostile to it, but the practitioners were. Uh, and the practitioners I'm talking about are not your everyday engineer with the hard hack going out giving directions on uh, how to build something. I'm mm -hmm. talking about the um, vice presidents for uh, and uh, high-level management, uh, and and some government, not all, but they were very hostile to this. Yes, they were. Diff they were. They disagreed with letting people know that, but. Uh, the book that I have recommended somewhere in this class by Henry Petrosky called uh, To Engineer is Human takes the position that engineering advances by way of its failures. Now, for some reason or another, <laughs> I had to so, well, now that book, I don't think reference Schindler at all, but that's just another way of thinking about Schindler's position. Right. It's a nicer way of saying it, maybe. And his idea was completely digested by the management and politically motivated engineers in the United States. They ate his book up. They loved it. So it depends on this. You, it, well, there's a formal term I understand in, um, in uh, uh, print media called the spin. <laughs> Uh, Petrosky put a different spin on it. And um, I'm going to make that case, unless I forget to do it, I'm going to make that case in my book that Shinsuke's theory did not die. It came out in another form, uh, with another language. Uh, and it was completely absorbed positively by the engineering community. So that is a lesson that you can take uh, to a, a class on uh, in literature that uh, you can make something, an idea, digestible or not, <laughs> depending on how you put the spin on it. Uh, what they used to do in the olden days was um, one of the things that I uh, am very much interested in is uh, a book by, ever read this book called The Nature of the Universe by Lucretius? Okay. Uh, it's a book that is um, pretty easy to read. Uh, and if you get it and set it on your shelf one day, one Sunday afternoon, you'll have nothing else to do. And you'll read through that book. And um, this is the fourth fifth century BC and he says that uh, the universe is made of atoms and between the atoms there's a void and the atoms move <laughs> and he says all of these things uh, in that time um, I'll give a talk on that if you're interested but the bottom line for what you just brought up is that uh, or what we're talking about when it comes to spin is the creases uh, tried to make his ideas known and people were not yawning and they were not interested. 
So he went back and wrote the whole thing over, wrote the whole thing up in verse. It's a poem. And he makes, he says, makes this metaphor. He says that uh, physician in his day, physicians uh, sometimes had the problem of getting some bitter medicine down the throat of a child. So what they would do with children is put the medicine in a cup and put some honey around the lip of the cup. And then say, oh, don't you want this honey? And the kids would lick on that. They'd love it. They'd start drinking it. By the time they realized what they were drinking, they got enough of it down. <laughs> Uh, to do it to good, and so he said that for that. So his poem, his poetry, was the honey on the lip of his uh, manuscript. So yes, uh, if we learn, we hear, we can all learn a whole lot about the power of a spin on a story. Petrovsky's spin was the same thing as Roman Shinsky's basic idea. Uh, what do you think this words? Slippery had to do with the title. That was an irritating word. <laughs> oh, keep talking. Exactly. Slippery refers to slippery slope. And slippery slope, uh, there are two formal terms uh, in en engineering ethics that mean the same thing. One is slippery slope, and the other is the domino effect. Okay, so those terms mean exactly what you think. That uh, once, once you put a, a particular idea uh, into a discussion, there will be uh, ripple effects, and those effects are called domino effects, or that you now are on a slippery slope. You will wind up. And what they usually, what philosophers, what engineering ethicists usually mean when they say this is that by, when you put that idea into an argument, you will inevitably wind up someplace that you don't want to be. <laughs> That's usually what they're talking about. So, okay. Um, oh, lastly, uh, what do you think about this last page over here? Well, do you remember in the uh, syllabus, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a reference to Cohen's uh, book called Discussion of the Method? Mm -hmm. Okay, now in that discussion of the method, Cohen comes up with something called he, what he calls heuristics. What he means by heuristics is that when you make an argument in engineering, um, you may come to a point where you want to say something and you can't prove it. Or you may come to a point where you want to use some tradition and you don't want to justify it. You'll say, we always do. 
these are his heuristics. And he's got a list of them. And it would be nice if you got your hands on that book and just looked at a couple of list of them. List of them. Some of them are, are, are sort of mundane. Like, for example, um, there's a heuristic about screws uh, that never make a screw that does not allow for three quarters of a turn. If you allow for a quarter of a turn, you're in bad shape. Now, he doesn't want to justify that. He just wants to say that uh, that's a good rule. It just seems to work out. Sometimes it fails, but it's a good rule to put in. Now, here's what this is all about. All right, and It starts with the idea that what we call modern engineering is evolved from the military. We're not talking about, per se, the pyramids or the Great Wall of China. We're not talking about Leonardo da Vinci's inventions. We're talking about what happens when, it, when you start talking about engineering in a university setting, and you want to put it in a university because you want it to uh, bring physics and math to bear on what they're doing. <clears throat> the first engineering school in the Western world was at uh, uh, Polytechnic Institute of Paris. And my dates may not be good, but it was. Uh, early 19th century, early, early 19th century. Anybody know the first engineering school in the United States? West Point. And the first civilian engineering school in the United States? Rensselaer, 1824. <laughs> okay. Um, in the military, There are, some, there are some characteristics about decision making that, def make, that define engineering and make a distinction in style. Okay. One of them is this, that the, that, that the mission is more important than the people in it, the soldiers. Second is that your decisions are, almost, are, are, are likely to be lethal to somebody. Thirdly, you don't have a whole lot of time to think the matter through. What we're talking about with those four principles there that we've discussed in, this, in the uh, news article, Slippery Ethics, are matters that apply to business, but they also apply to military. And they are, have all the three of those characteristics in them. They um, have imperatives that you've got to do something that um, there is a willing to risk life. And notice what I'm talking about. The decision maker is risking the lives of somebody else. <laughs> uh, and the third one is complexity, that you just don't have time, that the problem is just too complex to think through. Uh, there is a little quip that you can remember. The enemy's coming over the hill. What do I do? If you keep that in your mind, you'll understand a whole lot of uh, sophisticated things about engineering. That uh, you just, that you do, remember the picture of um, the school at Athens and everybody's laying around in there? Uh, 
Plato and all of them? You're not in there. <clears throat> so, um, that's what motivates this idea of heuristics. That if you need a principle, and, to, and you want to, that principle to be a scientific principle, you won't have time to get it. So what principle do you use in its place? Right. Use a heuristic. Now there's a beautiful metaphor in another, in another discipline. Actually, it's a, it's a combination of disciplines. Uh, it's called um, historical literature. And let me see, I can think of a good. There is a good piece that um, I will put on the board for you. Uh, if you have any friends in literature, ask them about historical literature, but ask them about this one. And The book is called, is, is entitled Justinian. And it's written by a man named Turtletaub. Turtletaub is a historian, but his book is historical literature. Now, what he wants to talk about is a man who was emperor of Rome who was deposed and disappeared for a time, 10, 20 years, and came back and got his emperorship back. <laughs> okay. And what he wants to do is to talk mostly about what he did when he disappeared. And clearly, there's not a whole lot that has been written down about what he did, where he went, and what his life was like. Hi. Uh, one thing is for certain, is that uh, he brought this lady back with him. And the two of them um, built this, um, built, got his throne back. Now, <sighs> Turtle Taub is able to discover a lot of people that um, Justinian encountered in, his, in this, when he was away. Uh, and he found some facts. He knows the beginning and the end. But how do you make a story that ties together the beginning and the end? All right. Well, one of the things he, and how do you make it readable for a uh, public that's really not interested in all of these people this man met? One of the things he does, which was done in the um, Name of the Rose, was that he would take three or four or five characters and conflict them all down into one character. That's a heuristic. <laughs> uh, another thing is he might not know exactly what the man did, uh, let's say, if he was in Antioch. But he knows the kinds, here it is, he knows the kinds of things that he would have done. He knows what the atmosphere was like in Antioch. He knew what people were thinking about what they were doing. Uh, and um, so what he would do is not ask what did he do, but what might he have done. That's a heuristic. Engineering, I think, is very much like that. That if you get an engineering document, you have to decide whether or not it's a branch of engineering science or not. If you think that if you have a doubt, then look at the logic. And somewhere, if you find somewhere in there that there's a heuristic that's used, okay, then you've got an engineering document, not a scientific document. Okay. Uh, and I can be more specific about that. But um, that's where that discussion came up in this article. A, 
and you'll find that in some of the most sophisticated engineering uh, research papers. You'll find something in there that you can't justify entirely scientifically. But it looks mathematically rigorous. Looks at, it's based, they're, they're reference Newton to somebody. But when you're sitting down with engineers, now you're graduate students, you're going to have to do this. You're going to have to look down and ask yourself, what is the argument? What is the justification for every line in, an, in a paper? And if you come to one that everybody says does not have a, ma a scientific or a mathematical or a reason that can be uh, justified, or let's put it this way, an argument that can be justified entirely on reason, right, then you ask, how can it be justified? Then if you can find that it can be justified based on something else, and I'll tell you what that something else is, it's called rhetoric. So there's a difference between a rhetorical argument and a discursive argument. A discursive argument is one that g tries to get you to believe my point, the point that I'm making in the story, based on reason and experience. Experience means the facts. Okay. A rhetorical argument tries to get you to join with me in a great adventure, regardless of the facts, or better stated, regardless of the absence of the facts in my argument. A good case of that is, let's go to the moon. So when NASA says, let's go to the moon, or better stated, when they said, let's go to the moon, let's put a man on the moon, uh, there were a lot of things we needed to know in order to give the public a discursive argument that we can get to the moon. We didn't do that. Otherwise, we never would have left. <laughs> you know, because you get into, uh, this is another formal term called circular argument. You get into a circular argument. I have to know something. The only way I can know it is to go there uh, to find it out. But then I've gone. <laughs> I think we're in, my, my watch says we got another 20 minutes. All right, so uh, <clears throat> well, that's the power of these heuristics, and, and Cohen talks about those in detail. And so um, I think that that's the starting point for, for really understanding what engineers do when we uh, decide that we're not going to be entirely scientific or discursive about what we do. And the importance in ethics to that is that in a, in a, um, in a participatory democracy, the decision maker has to understand that they're not being asked by these experts to believe what they're saying. They're not being asked to believe in the experts. They're asked to join with the experts in some kind of an adventure. By going to the moon. Ms. Beth, you're thinking very hard on that point. You want to share your thoughts? Well, another thing is um, that in this class, not in all um, venues, but in this class, uh, trust is not going to be, be given a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. what, do you mean, what do you mean? In an ethical argument? Or where would we try to use trust? Uh, you want to jump in there? I was going to say, back in the day, we thought this was not aware of this. So, like, we just aren't aware of the engineers. So, when people say they are okay with the engineers pushing this frontier. I think that's debatable. Um, I think there's a segment of the public that's aware of risk and okay with the engineers pushing the risk. But data comments sort of provide evidence that there's also people in the public that aren't aware of the risk that sort of assume 
engineers are really smart and really educated and this is based on are doing really good sound. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, but you don't think that? Well, I don't know. I was reading this article. They did mention stuff about people who are think they can have money more and can better evaluate. Um, Somebody said that? I trust, but like he was talking about a bottle cap, people who know how to regulate, you know, what drugs are good and how to keep it away from their kids, you know, they might say, we don't need a bottle cap, but there are people who, for whatever reason, don't know anything about you know, being safe around drugs or whatever. So it's there for people who you know, don't have that type of missing capability. So, and those things come through regulation. He also said regulation comes come in different areas depending on how many tombstones. How many tombstones? Yeah. He talks about three wire. Right? Oh. Well, um, I think that uh, what trust, the way I'm going to treat trust, and I emphasize the word I, not necessarily you. The way I'm going to treat trust is that when a person says, trust me, the person is saying, don't worry about believing what I say, believe in me. Right. And no matter how decent a person you are, I don't want to believe in anybody. Okay. I want to believe what you say or disbelieve right. what you say or show. Right. All right. So therefore, I think that uh, there was a time when people trusted um, the doctors, didn't get second opinions, the lawyers, and et cetera. But today, I think that trust is not a big, powerful word anymore because I think it means what I just said it means. It means believing in as opposed to believing that. And nobody doesn't want to do it. Nobody wants to do that anymore. Uh, that does not mean a person should not be trustworthy, <laughs> worthy of trust. Okay, having good character. No, I mean a person should have good character. What it means is that a citizen should not have a relationship with an expert based on trust. But they must, but, and what I was just thinking was, you know, but they, they might, or they do. So, yes. And that's something engineers need to be aware of. Right. Yeah. Uh, and the reason, the reason that I didn't give that a lot of emphasis when you said it is because I remember when there was a time when people did trust experts, particularly engineers. Uh, and what we have changed away from is a great deal of trust to not necessarily skepticism, but uh, some, some sort of equality that I want to make, where I want to make a distinction between specialist expertise and generalist expertise. They want to be an equal with the expert on, in what they call generalist expertise. We'll go into that later. All right. But uh, that's, that's the way, I, that's the way um, we're talking. Okay, have we done with this uh, paper? Well, let's jump straight into um, the nuclear. Would you want, let's do three miles. One of, I'll tell you what, why don't we ha ask one of the um, students for credit to give us a synopsis of one of the uh, cases and ask the other one to do it the other one. Which, who wants to do Chernobyl and who wants to do Three Mile Island, better known as TMI? Well, then do the one that came first, TMI. Okay. Do TMI. Date, place? March 
which prevented the generators from removing the heat from the plant. So I guess first the turbine shut down automatically and the pressure in the primary system began to increase um, and the relief valve opened. Um, the valve should have closed when the pressure increased by a certain amount, but it did not. Um, and the signals that the operator was receiving didn't show um, that the valve was still open, and as a result, cooling water poured out of the, the valve and caused the core of the reactor to overheat. Well, what's the problem with the water? That would be it, right? Yeah. Um, well, I tell you what, let me ask a, a, um, a, what I think is a real good question. What's the difference between the way a nuclear power plant operates and the way a nuclear bomb operates? Well, it's What's the difference between a bomb and a bomb? You control the purpose of it, for one thing. I mean, the purpose. Well, I want the mechanism. The bomb just explodes faster. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's, it's... It just speeds the reaction. Yes. The other one is control, keeping the reaction down so that you can use the heat for uh, other purposes. Yes. To run the turbines, to make the steam, to make the um, electricity, uh, and et cetera. So, so there were two things kind of going on. One yeah. interpretation is that of the plant was a little faulty and the indicators and all um, were not up to par. They weren't what they should have been. And another criticism has been that the person, I don't know if they mentioned the guy who was on duty was not well trained and some of the staffing at, at the plant was not adequate for I mean, what they were doing and, and damage that could have been caused. They did say that in one of the synopsis I read, I read that the people on duty had less training than they should have had. Than they should have had. Okay. And at one point they missed a signal that valves were closed. Right. Now, um, that last complaint about uh, being trained well enough, mm -hmm. uh, you'll find that complaint almost everywhere. Um, what, uh, let me see if there, what, what ethical issues, did you see any ethical issues in this particular case? I um, didn't necessarily see any in the immediate response by the technicians to the alarms and like I, I felt like there they were just acting on instinct and they 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 weren't there weren't that many ethics involved. It's not like they they didn't know something was going wrong. So and this goes back to what you were saying about the time scale that most engineers are on. I mean that happened. And these things are well, that was time yeah, it's kind of maybe too late at that point to say they reacted the wrong way because you know, yeah. yeah, but there were definitely ethical issues in the decisions that the authorities made about when when to tell the next level yes. of authority and when to tell the public and whether or not to evacuate. It, it seemed easy. It was easiest for me to find ethical issues in those decisions. Um, how how risky is the rate? How much of a risk is a small amount of radiation that has leaked out to the people versus how much of a risk is it to evacuate everyone, which is costly and could produce more accidents? So actually, one of the way, one way to look at it is it was that it was a safety, an ethical issue was a safety issue uh, because uh, even when I wrote this article about um, uh, safety not being the most important issue, I didn't say that it was not an issue. That you safety is a big issue in engineering, and notice what I'm saying about engineering is what I think engineering is, not necessarily what it should be. So, um, so there was a safety issue, as to, and 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 the question was uh, had to do with uh, notification of the public and evacuation of the area. All right. I have a question about safety. Is it's a show of safety. Of engineers to push the frontiers, the 
passion about discovering new things and utility and stuff like that. I don't know if how how much does I'm sure a lot of engineering you know, safety is right up there with everything because of them, but I mean when you put them in a group let's say the environment at four and that's so safety gets kind of pushed down. And that's why I think government I keep bringing up the government and regulations, but I think they have tried they are there to try to like raise the the weight that the engineers would put on safety. So I think if you if they want wasn't that any mechanism to put the range on engineers and say the public was member then there probably you know, a lot of disasters happening all the time. An argument that I made once um, really was not so much not so much an argument as uh, as an experience with was that um, it, when engineers and the so-called public disagree on the um, margins of safety, then what the engineers uh, have done is to go back to a public forum and say, well, we can be more safe, but a glass of water will cost you a dollar. Then the public will start saying, well, <laughs> start agreeing with the engineer. So uh, actually what happens in, in, in real life is that the more the public is informed, the more the public tends to be like the engineer. They don't want to spend a dollar for a glass of water. Now what really, uh, and I'm going to get um, Professor Levinson in here who does safety, uh, to talk, talk about safety in particular. But um, there have been some psychological studies on safety. And people regard safety psychologically uh, in a way that's not entirely rational. Uh, one example that I know about, and I'm, I'm talking about secondary sources now for me. The, the, the sources are good scientific sources, but I'm talking about what I've read. You can read it too. Right. <laughs> it's not an argument that I'm making. Uh, the uh, people tend to think that an airplane is less safe than a car. It is. <laughs> the probability of being injured or dying in an automobile accident is like three or four orders of magnitude greater than dying or being uh, hurt in an airplane. Now, the conclusion that I've heard made, and I have to buy because I'm reading it, uh, not trusting in, but I do have uh, some basis of trust for what, the, what, um, what scholars and experts say to each other in public when they debate it, uh, is that the mind regulates safety in very complex ways, and one way is, is control. You're not in control in the airplane. You're in control with the car, so you think. And so you think it's safer because you, you feel safer because you have control. But um, getting down to the public when it comes to business of safety, if you get it into an open forum where the engineers are there saying, I can give you what you want, here's what you have to pay for it, uh, there's a good likelihood that by, by the time the day is over, that everybody agrees <laughs> to go back to square one. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me give you some surrounding circumstances. Uh, today is, we'll conclude this on Thursday. Then I'm going to ask uh, between Thursday and Tuesday, y'all write something. We're going to do some more writing. Uh, <clears throat> Find out what this movie is about and when it was made called The China Syndrome. You don't have to see it. You probably don't want to see it. <laughs> but I think you need to see it. The important thing about The China Syndrome is two, well, the, the two important reasons, the two reasons I gave you this as an assignment is just to 
what I want you to know is the theme of this, of this film and the date that it was made. And what I want you to do is to look at the theme and the date and compare it with the date and your analysis of TMI. Um, and uh, on June the 1st, 1979, I went to work for a nuclear regulatory commission. <laughs> uh, and uh, they were still buzzing about, clearly buzzing about TMI. So I can give you some uh, first-hand personal experiences with what it was like when people were buzzing around. I went to work at the research office. It was in Washington, D.C. And it was, it was a combined mechanical and civil engineering research office. And, and they had just started with, um, with a, um, an administrative experiment called um, Summer Research Faculty Fellows. And they just start, and I, I was, they said I was the first one. But uh, it was an experiment. And, but I got to, as an experiment, uh, I got to walk around the see and meet and talk to a whole lot of people. And one of them, uh, his last name was Costello, I'll never forget him, real decent guy, uh, had a, um, with the, the equivalent of a cell phone, uh, on a beeper, uh, on his uh, belt. And, when, and the idea, it was common knowledge that the idea was, and this is what I was told, that when that beeper went off, somebody was calling him. So it was high security, and people were nervous on a daily, hour-to-hour -hour basis. So I can give you some background on that. Uh, what does uh, your textbook, does your textbook say anything about the moral issues in that? Yeah, the textbook didn't kind of much we had to go to other sources. Okay. Uh, try another source, see what they say about it. Uh, see if anybody has anything to say about the ethical issues. And then I have something to say about the ethical issues. Then we're going to do uh, Chernobyl. Oh, i got one other assignment before you get back. And then we'll call it a day. Anybody heard of this cartoon called Speed Racer? Okay. Uh, there are two versions of it, the old version and the new version. Uh, speed version is a cartoon made for children. Uh, the new version, I don't know what it does. The new version came out in, uh, I think, the 80s. The old version came out, um, well, no, the new version came out in the, late, in the middle 1990s. The old version came out uh, right before this. Um, the theme was to give the child experience of what it's like to be in a non-Newtonian universe. So when Speed Racer got in his car and started driving down the street, the tops of the buildings would curve in at the top, which is exactly what's predicted if you approach the speed of light. <laughs> and so one of the arguments that I heard made was the real trouble with uh, nuclear power in this country was that the engineers could not, did not have an intuition for it. And so the public didn't trust what they had to say. They didn't think they really, they thought they knew, all that they knew was the calculations. 